Good morning, and thanks for joining this web conference with uh, Leaksaw Asset Management. Today, we're going to be discussing the results of Leaksaw's Active Passive Navigator for H1 2020. I'm Tony Todd, a senior consultant at Rumeur Publique, Leaksaw's communications partner. I'm joined today by the authors of the Active Passive Navigator, Vincent Denoiseau, who's Leaksaw's head of ETF research and solutions, and with Jean-Baptiste Berton, who is Leaksaw's senior cross-asset strategist. Before we begin, a technical point. To the right of the screen in YouTube, you'll see a box where you can post comments and questions. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A. I will put your questions to the speakers. It's important that you have to sign into YouTube to post your questions. Uh, so if you're not signed in, please do that now. Uh, alternatively, if you prefer, you can email me your questions at tony at rumeurpublique.fr. That uh, email address um, is underneath the, um, the video box. Thank you very much. The Active Passive Navigator for H1 2020 looks at the main trends that influence global market performance and alpha generation by active managers in the first half of 2020. As we all know, the first half of the year was very eventful, very eventful for global economies and for markets where we've seen significant volatility. That volatility has been un an unprecedented test for active managers. So how have they fared? As we'll see, it's been a positive experience for equity managers. It's been a much more challenging period on the uh, fixed income side. So what can we learn from this extraordinary period? Let's hear first from Vincent Denoiseau, who's going to give us an overview of the challenges and opportunities faced by active managers. Vincent, over to you. Thank you very much, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in the 40 minutes or so, uh, Jean-Baptiste and I will present essentially three things. Number one, we'll, we'll present you an in-depth perspective on the performance delivered by active managers uh, between January and June 2020. We will draw as well the picture with regard to performances over the long term, which is key for many investors. And last but not least, Jean-Baptiste will provide some forecasts for the next few months. Uh, for the next few months. Before moving into the results, let's quickly review this summary. So, number one, I will start with a methodology. I will be very brief uh, and we'll sketch some lights on how we look at active managers, how this performance is analyzed and so forth. Then I will delve into equities and specific equity subsegments, like typically small caps and so forth. Uh, Jean Baptiste will hand over uh, covering fixed income uh, and its various subsegments. Then I will take the mic back and uh, discuss the long view, i.e. how do you look at active managers in the long run. And last but not least, Jean-Baptiste will conclude by presenting the prospect for the alpha environment. Um, let's briefly go through the methodology. So uh, a lot has been already researched, written and commented on this active and passive debate. Uh, we find two main streams in this debate, long-term perspective and short-term views. How we look at that within Lixor, we try to cover essentially this, both, both of these sides, i.e. long-term and short-term. Very briefly, uh, broad, so we want to cover a large suite of asset segments, typically both on the large cap and the small caps with regard to equities. Uh, we want to be uh, fair and transparent, that goes without saying. Uh, just, to, just to clarify, what do we mean by that? We look at, for each asset class, we look at one benchmark and we calculate the net, what we call the net benchmark. So, i.e., we deduct the prevailing fees of this asset class so that we have a, a fair and transparent way of analyzing active, uh, active returns vis-a-vis -vis the net benchmark. Yeah, and maybe last but not least, we are detailed. So, if you want to know everything about each asset subsegment, we have a detailed report on that and we do that on a quarterly basis. But let's move on, uh, th um, essentially, through this semester. Um, and, and let me just draw a few, a few points on how we look at this spectrum. So alpha, so i.e. the outperformance of active managers, is essentially, in our, our, our view, a combination of opportunities and skills. We look at the aggregate. We look at things on average, so heat ratio, the excess return. So we will. So the skill factor, in mathematical term, we say that it's averaging out. So we are looking essentially, from our perspective, at the opportunity set. 
uh, of the opportunity set, like dispersion. If you look at the chart on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that H1, so Jan to June, has been pretty much, we've seen three market cycles in just six months, which, to be honest, is absolutely unprecedented. So what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that in January to February, uh, we've seen a mildly positive uh, forecast for, for equity markets and for fixed income. So it, we had a very big, massive dispersion between the single stocks. So it was a fertile uh, landscape for typically for active managers to deliver some alpha. This market has been, um, has been followed by the two months we all know. So uh, February, uh, March, March and April. Uh, and just one number for that, it has been the fastest 20% drop of the S&P 500. So it meant that to be successful during through this market phase, you had to be defensive and very you, you have to be fast defensive to be able to protect your portfolio. Last but not least, May to June, uh, what has been called the most hated rally uh, by active managers. What does it mean? So essentially central bank coordinated actions along with some improvement on the sanitary side, uh, essentially fostered one of the fastest rally we've ever seen in financial markets. What does it mean in practice from an alpha perspective? You had to be offensive. Now let's combine the two things I just mentioned. You had to be super defensive in March, April, and then quickly change your mindset and to capture most of the upside. So in technical terms, we would call it having a higher beta than one. Let's face it, it has been challenging for asset managers, but overall, as we will see, uh, equity managers have been able to navigate the market reasonably well. So why that? Because as you can see on your screen, we had sector, country, and factor this we had as well single stock dispersion, which is a positive when you look at active managers. As we will see, 53% of equity managers have outperformed. So that's the average across asset segments. And very in, in particular, we will see that small cap, small cap funds uh, on average had a 70% hit ratio. So i.e. it was not easier, but at least active managers have been more pro, uh, successful uh, on the small cap side. And in the meantime, we'll see that U.S. large cap funds have suffered. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. So this has been a very uh, tough context. And we know that equity and fixed income managers have had very different experiences. So let's start off um, about the performance on the equity side of things. Thank you, Tony. Um, let's look at an equity dashboard. So that's typically the, the technical side of our job, if you wish. Uh, th these have... These are the, probably the four numbers that active managers will remember from the from the, the semesters. Of course, they are they are, they are looking at many more. But in a nutshell, we've seen elevated outflows. So I uh, so you can see that funds minus 64 billion in in March. So which is not unprecedented, but it's a very high numbers to many extent. We faced a very high implied volatility. So in technical term, it's just the volatility of the market. We had elevated volumes. That's the chart on the bottom in the in the in the middle, and on the right hand side, a bit more technical, the liquidity. So what we are representing here is essentially the the bid offer that we observed on the asset class. So typically on S and P 500. So you have the the median of the bid offer of the constituent of the S and P 500 and the top D side. Just a, a quick a quick summary of that. This liquidity has been divided by five to ten, depending on how you measure it and so forth. This has been a key, uh, a key um, issue for asset managers because when you are an active manager, you have a higher turnover. You need to move to rotate your portfolio. So i.e. this rotation has been much more costly. So that's for the, the big picture. Uh, Vincent, you mentioned uh, earlier that there was a difference between large cap and small cap performances. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's hard to make a summary on all asset classes. So I selected typically world large cap because I think it was exemplifying nicely what happened. So um, and and overall, I, I brought you two charts to summarize uh, the, wall, uh, the the condition for world large cap. On the left hand side, you have a representation of two things: the equity market performance that the X axis and the uh, average lockdown activity. So it sounds a bit technical, but it's, it's, it's essentially a measure of how the economic has been impacted on a country by country basis. So i.e. how much of the lockdown has impacted the activity on, the, on these countries. 
And as you can see, there has been, there has been a tremendous impact on the equity markets. And you have a pretty, a pretty high correlation between these two, these two factors. So let's take uh, the, uh, the perspective of an, of an active manager. As you might remember, we had something like pretty much like a wave from Asia to Europe and US from, the, from, uh, from a COVID uh, spreading perspective. And it meant that there has been dispersion between countries. So what does it mean is, of course, if the sanitary conditions were absolutely uh, quite tough uh, to manage for everyone, there has been dispersion for the active managers. On the right hand side, that's the outcome. You have two things the total return of active manager and the net benchmark. So i.e. You, you can see that, yeah, they are virtually uh, on top of each other. But when we look in more details, and that's pretty much our job, uh, we can see the difference between the net benchmark and the active, the active funds. Uh, this excess return is in blue bars. And you can see that it's a small number, but you can see that overall the excess return has increased from January to March, i.e., there has been some ways to generate alpha which have been uh, implemented by active managers. So until March, we've seen in creation of added value by active managers. And since then, uh, since not the end of the crisis, but the trough of the market, what happened? Essentially, um, given uh, essentially the easing of the sanitary, uh, of the lockdown and so forth, and the uh, central bank's intervention, very fast market, which has been extremely tough to, to catch for, for active managers. So you have this picture for world large cap, but it would be similar, very similar, actually slightly better for European large cap as well. So there has been dispersion, which has been utilized by active managers to deliver some alpha. But yes, at the, at the end of the, uh, of the rally, not, not the end, but at least uh, until June, the rally has been extremely tough to catch for large cap managers. And uh, what can you tell us about small cap? Uh, they, they've been uh, the big success. Yes, uh, small cap is definitely the bright spot of equity uh, of equity through the first semester. Overall, if you take the average of all small cap managers we are looking at, so typically uh, to name a few US, UK, world, and so forth, uh, you have a set, an average of 70% of small cap managers which have outperformed, who have outperformed, sorry, their, their benchmark. So uh, how do, can we look at it in practice? Left hand side, you have exactly the same type of uh, typology of chart. So total return of the net of the benchmark, of the active funds. You can see visually that the difference is much higher. In, in actual numbers, you have essentially an alpha which has exceeded 7% over six months. So that's a massive alpha generation. How can we explain that? So if we look at the various phases of the crisis, small cap on the on the on the on the crisis on the on the downside of the market um, small cap active funds strongly out of from their benchmarks typically they have been able to uh, to utilize sector rotation out of consumer discretionary energy and financials into the defensive growth and quality segments early stage of the rebound uh, dispersion of small cap was all time high which is a positive uh, and through the, uh, through the, uh, the recovery of the market, uh, they have been able to continue the alpha generation as the environment was supportive for small cap, uh, for small cap funds for alpha generation. So as you can see on the right hand side, they gave up a bit of the alpha gains in the later phase of the market rally, but still overall a uh, pretty nice picture for this, uh, for this funds. Um, just to make a quick recap uh, for H1 for equity funds, uh, as we saw, so you have two tables. Left hand side, it's what we call the heat ratio. You can find these numbers on the research report. Um, and this heat ratio, as you can see, is ranging from 76 to 31 uh, percent. On the bottom of this chart, you have US large cap blend. I will make a deep dive on US large cap later in this presentation. On average, 53 percent of active managers have outperformed uh, on the equity side. On the right hand side, it's more if you want to make a, a bit more of a deep dive. Why do we show as well the excess return? It's not because we love numbers. Actually, we do. But in fact, uh, if you outperform, you can outperform by 10 basis points or by 5%. So the excess return is, in our, from our, in our opinion, is probably a bit more pervasive, a bit more holistic in the way we capture the amount of alpha which has been generated. And you can see that this excess return has ranged from essentially 7.4%, 7, 7 which is absolutely 
outstanding, they're down to minus 2.6%. Key messages, just to recap, 53% of active equity managers beat their benchmarks in the first half, and active small cap came out on top with a 70% average of performance. Thanks very much, uh, Vincent. Uh, so we can summarise that uh, active managers, especially small cap, appear to have coped uh, very, very well with the volatility. Um, Jean-Baptiste, what can you tell us about the fixed income universe? Why, were they, um, why, why was it more of a challenge for them? Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. Indeed, H1 was clearly a, a very rough ride for uh, fixed income managers. Uh, early this year, you may remember that uh, global growth was uh, starting to pick up. Uh, with uh, trade wars and Brexit uncertainties uh, started to, uh, to, to, to be posed. Uh, central banks were also less active. Uh, now, two months later, managers suddenly faced uh, a collapse in, in yield and, and a massive credit crunch. So in this context, all styles suffered, uh, though quite unevenly, actually. Uh, and in general, those that uh, outperformed during the crash uh, lagged in the rally and vice versa. So let's zoom uh, on the sample and fixed income segment, uh, starting with the, the, the sovereign funds, uh, which clearly were the, the hardest uh, hit. They were uh, wrong-footed, uh, hoping for higher yields and, uh, and inflation, uh, just when the COVID started to hit. And then they couldn't keep up with the, the massive bond rally, uh, with an avalanche of uh, stimulus and icing on the cake, uh, an unscheduled uh, Fed meeting. So. Very hard to time these uh, type of markets. Um, in nuance, typically European managers tended to, to do a little better. Uh, they've been able to arbitrage very uh, diverging country situations according to the, 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 the handling of the, uh, of the, the, the pandemic. Uh, so that's for Q1. In Q2, they retraced some of their losses. They successfully played uh, a reversal in inflation and also the, the steepening of the curve. Um, and last point, uh, typically range trading yields were also easier to beat. So that's for sovereign uh, <clears throat> funds. Now turning to the, uh, uh, to the uh, high grade uh, managers, uh, the picture is uh, somewhat uh, brighter, but not massively so. They were aggressively positioned uh, before COVID for at least two reasons. The first one is that they, uh, they um, structurally tend to um, uh, overweight lower ratings. Uh, the, 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 the objective there is to tilt their portfolios. And the second reason for their positioning is that they were also quite bullish uh, regarding the macro environment. So as a result, they, uh, they, they took a beating when, uh, when the market crashed. Uh, in Q2, uh, in contrast, they did a little better as market, uh, market conditions started to, to stabilize. Uh, and again, European managers uh, also had a wider pool of a sector and country relative base. Um, yeah, so that, that's, these are two um, strategies, uh, sovereign managers and corporate were, were the, the, the hardest hit in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in these markets. Thanks, Jean-Baptiste. Um, we understand how difficult it was uh, to navigate this U-turn in bonds and IEG. What about the high yield managers? How did they get on? Yeah, in, uh, in high yield, the, the, the picture was quite uh, different. Uh, actually, they did very well uh, during the, the, the market crash. They uh, competed with uh, benchmarks, which literally collapsed as liquidity dried up. Uh, besides, they were um, cautiously exposed. Unlike high-grade managers, they, um, they structurally tend to overweight higher quality paper. The, the objective there is to manage their, uh, their risk. Uh, and they were also quite cautious at a time when um, credit me metrics, if you remember, in, in the, the high yield segments, were starting to, to weaken, uh, concern about cov light covenants, etc. So cautiously exposed. And as I mentioned, uh, Vincent, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the key reasons why they, uh, they uh, behaved uh, very well. There's a, a, another reason also uh, is that the huge dispersion between sectors, such as tourism versus tech, for instance, uh, that, that provided a lot of alpha, quite easy to, uh, to arbitrage because the, the, the dispersion rational was quite uh, obvious. And this is illustrated in the chart uh, where you can see the, the dispersion uh, in, in the high yield segment really uh, soaring massively over the, the, the crash. Uh, so very good, uh, very good behavior during the market crash. Unfortunately, they lost all of their advance in, uh, in the rally because um, basically they, they stayed uh, they, they stayed. 
cautious. So if we move on to the, um, the, the EM debt uh, universe, um, it was um, clearly uh, a hill start for uh, EM debt managers. Um, the indiscriminate selling pressure and also the drying liquidity uh, overshadowed the very divergent country situation in EM markets. Um, conversely, in Q2, uh, as markets, uh, markets started to stabilize, uh, EM managers have been able to capture these uh, relative uh, opportunities. And there were many of them, a uh, very different situation between Latin America, uh, with a full COVID expansion, whereas Asia uh, handled the, the, the situation better. So many, many different situations that these managers were uh, able to, to capture. Um, uh, so maybe a, a quick summary uh, on, on these uh, these uh, these styles, um, as as discussed, it was a very difficult uh, H1 for uh, most fixed income managers. Very few sovereign funds were able to outperform. Uh, actually, less than 25%. Uh, typically, the, the U.S. managers, uh, in particular, uh, lagged markets by more than 2%, which is huge uh, in in, uh, in the in the U.S. Treasury segment. Um, in contrast, uh, high yield and EM managers were a little more resilient, uh, and the main reason is their ability to arbitrage uh, much higher dispersion. So all in all, clearly a semester uh, when investors were much better off with, uh, with passive products. Thanks very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste. It, it seems, like you say, to have been a very rough ride for um, fixed income. Um, Vincent, what's your analysis of what Alpha might look like over a longer observation window? Yes, indeed. Moving on from performances observed through 2020, we wanted to give you a brief overview of what Alpha might look like uh, over a long, longer term uh, perspective, uh, picture. So the chart you, you will see looks looks a bit complicated uh, so uh, it looks very technical uh, but overall it's essentially uh, the same thing over two two observation window on the x axis you have the active performance in 2018 so i'm looking here at us large cap my active manager and on the y axis it's exactly the same number so the active performance of active manager uh, in 2019 so what does it mean? It's a zoom over this asset class. Each dot is one active manager. So as you can expect, the, the good ones, so the outperforming ones, would be on the top uh, right-hand corner. And the underperforming, uh, underperforming one, underperforming one, sorry, uh, on both 2018 and 2019 would be on the bottom left-hand corner. So, but as, as we said, we are looking at aggregates. We are looking at things on average uh, to get some, some, some ideas and to get some perspective on what can happen over the uh, entire asset class. And to that extent, we are looking at the regression line. So, i.e., to get a sense of if there is some commonalities between, uh, if there are some commonalities between the funds. So, i.e., if you have been outperforming in 2018, are you, did you outperform in 2019 as well? So to verify that, we would need an upward sloping curve, i.e. we would need to, to see that to be good in 2018, to summarize, would be reflected in 2019. As you can see here, at least on average, it's, it's hard. It's very hard to generate consistent uh, alpha, typically on the U.S. large cap, uh, on, on, US, on, the, on U.S. large cap, sorry. So what does it mean in practice? We have a chart which is uh, so the, which we call the long view uh, on U.S. equities, which is representing each ratios over five years and excess returns over five years. So just bear in mind, it's a rolling window. So we are looking at the same U.S. large cap equity fund, and we are seeing if how their outperformance has changed over time. These two measures, you can see that they move very closely. So one is so the, the dark blue one is using the, the, the scale on the right. So it's a, it's a percent, it's excess return, and the, the light blue area is showing you the heat ratio, how it has changed, uh, and you need to look at the, at the left hand side for, for following this heat ratio. So two uh, yeah two two takeaways from that. 
So the heat ratio, you can see that it's quite low, in fact. So we're now looking at around 15%, give or take. So i.e., when you accumulate the alpha of active managers, uh, typically on US large cap, it's quite hard to outperform on a consistent basis. So the heat ratio is quite limited. Second observation, you can see that it has decreased since 2008. So i.e., on an asset class which, is, which seems to be tough to find alpha uh, with, within it, uh, you can see that on top of that, this alpha has decreased uh, over, the, over the, the last few years. So i.e., to, find, to consistently, uh, consistently beat your benchmark has become, has become a very complicated job for active managers on such a liquid asset class. So it was just to, to provide you a zoom on this asset class, US large cap, uh, you will see that in this table, uh, so the long view for equities, you can see that this asset class is precisely the one which is in the bottom of this of this table. So, i.e., um, uh, so it has been a 12 percent hit ratio which has been observed. You can see that on the on the the, the right on the bottom right hand corner uh, of this table. So, five years U.S. large cap blend. This table has a lot of numbers, but it's in my view it's it's a quite important one. So why that? Because overall, you can you can find the year-to-date number that we we already commented, so the 53% on average. Of course, if you want, we can look uh, in some details, some asset classes, and so forth. But overall, I will just right straight away look at the average. So, i.e., how the average of the each ratio evolves when uh, you. Eat increase the observation window from year to date, 53%, to one year, 47, three years, 30, 34, and, and five years, 36, so broadly speaking, decreasing. What does it mean? It means that if an investor has a long-term investment perspective, if an investor wants to capture a broad asset class, the, what we would call the risk premium of this asset class, Quite a few investors are doing that via strategic asset allocation and so on, and they might sit on their investment for quite some time. In this context, and in particular for liquid asset classes like US large cap, my belief is that, that uh, for this type of um, utilization, if you wish, type of investment, ETF, in my opinion, seem to be a compelling at alternatives to active funds, in particular for asset classes which are liquid uh, like US large cap. Thanks very much, uh, Vincent. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, I'd be very interested to hear your opinion on that. Uh, you know, what situation are we in now? Are we anywhere near a return to normal? Uh, but what, what's, your, what's your view on this? Maybe one comment uh, on, um, on what uh, Vincent uh, just discussed uh, about the, the, the long-term um, ability to, uh, to extract alpha. In practice, um, to add some nuance, many allocators tend to, to rotate their portfolios more frequently. Uh, which th then uh, make these results a little less uh, scary, if I may say. Uh, so sitting for years on funds uh, can make sense in uh, inefficient or niche markets that can deliver a sustainable alpha. But in mainstream markets, uh, typically alpha is much more sensitive to the cycle, which requires uh, mobility. So in both, case, in both cases, we think that um, this analysis uh, that uh, Vincent just uh, described is clearly a reminder that um, fund selection of quality and uh, dynamic asset allocations are really crucial to, to navigate financial markets. Um, and uh, to uh, get back to your question, Tony, um, after this, uh, this uh, deep dive in the past, we wanted to share with you how we see uh, the, the coming environment. Uh, typically, uh, H1 was uh, really uh, unique. Um, but we still expect a, a quite a typical backdrop going forward with uh, a number of uh, features that will uh, impact uh, the alpha backdrop. On the bright side, uh, we think that uh, <clears throat> asset dispersion will be uh, elevated, uh, reflecting uneven responses to the, to the virus, both sanitary and economic, and also an uneven sharing of the, the COVID cost. Um, also, on the bright side, uh, we, we think that with uh, yields now close to zero, uh, portfolio hedging will be uh, a key challenge for many investors, um, making bottom-up pickers uh, all the more attractive. Uh, that said, um, valuation, in our view, 
will remain uh, quite rich and distorted by uh, stimulus, monetary and fiscal, uh, which will be a big hurdle for uh, fundamental uh, approaches. Uh, meanwhile, politics, such as U.S. elections, uh, trade wars, uh, the, the, the heated debate on, on fiscal package, all of this, in our view, will, will, will add a, a, a nice dose of uh, unpredictability, which will make market timing a, a, a quite tricky business. So that, that, that's the environment that will directly hit the, uh, the active managers. Um, now, regarding market prospects, um, we think um, they, will, they will remain positive. Uh, the, the, the growth will remain positive, but laborious. And so we, we think it makes sense to keep a, a positive tilt on risk assets. But at the same time, uh, returns will probably be uh, milder uh, going forward. Instead, uh, we expect more opportunities at sector and theme levels, uh, especially in the ones that will be the next drivers of the post-COVID cycle. Uh, you may see on the, on the left side uh, a graph which, are, which is showing a number of these trends. Uh, that there's been a, a temporary correction in some of the, these, uh, these themes. But as you can see, um, since the crash, there really uh, have been the, 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 the main winners. And many fund managers are uh, counting on this. Um, in relative value or with a passive product. Thanks very much. And so, you know, just to recap, you know, you, you said just now that uh, there should be a, a balance between passive and active. What, what is your advice to investors now? Should they be um, taking a more passive approach or how should they balance um, their, their portfolios between passive and active? Yeah, um, um, we think that uh, with all these uh, comments, uh, key patterns for the, the, the next uh, coming environment, we think that the search for uh, diversification and alternative sources of uh, performance will really be key for uh, most investors. Um, and we think that the combination of active and passive strategies will be best fit to benefit from both rising asset uh, differentiation and also the, all the promises from uh, uh, secular trends such as uh, the, the clean energy, Cyber security, 5G, um, home working, etc. There are many of them, and we really think that this combination will be a winning mix. Um, thanks very much, and uh, 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 Vincent, um, uh, do you have a, um, a, a wrap up for for uh, the, the, the? What are your key takeaways from the Active Passive Navigator? Yeah, sure, Tony. Uh, conventional wisdom is that active managers aim to protect portfolios during periods of uh, eight and market volatility. And the first semester has been a unique illustration for such a volatile market environment. So what we saw is that equity managers performed reasonably well uh, with 53% average it ratio in the fund universe uh, that we covered in this report. That's been a perfect storm for fixed income managers. And last but not least, alpha generation is a long term. In the long term, is uh, proving to be challenging. So, so over a long term, um, over a long, longer observation window, sustainable alpha generation remains a difficult exercise for most. As an outcome, and in particular for investors looking at holding long term positions, passive investment vehicles like ETF can provide sometimes useful anchors in this situation where alpha is harder to find. Ultimately. From a portfolio construction perspective, such a volatile market reminded us about the crucial importance of fund selection and the need for a robust asset allocation framework. Yeah, and maybe <clears throat> can I add some comments on a, a recap on the, on the alpha prospects. Um, as discussed, market conditions, in our view, will remain unusual for the for the in the coming months. Um, asset dispersion will clearly be will clearly be a major advantage for uh, active managers, but with a number of hurdles uh, that, uh, that we, we, we described. Meanwhile, headline market performance will probably be uh, more modest going forward. The opportunities, in our view, will lie beneath at sector and uh, theme level. And so that's why we think that the combination of both active and passive, um, passive when it's uh, harder to ex extract sustainable alpha, that makes a lot of sense in our, in our view. Thank you very much, um, Vincent, and thank you very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste, uh, uh, for that um, uh, uh, 
excellent uh, detailed explanation of the uh, active passive navigator. We're going to move on now uh, to the Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, this is your last uh, opportunity, I guess, to post them in the chat box on YouTube, uh, just to the, uh, the, the side <coughs> of the video box. Uh, don't forget that you have to sign in to do that, or you can email your questions to me directly, uh, tony at rumeurpublic.fr. That's tony at rumeurpublic.fr. Uh, that uh, email address is underneath um, underneath the video box. Um, I've had a couple of questions in by email already. Um, the first one, I guess, would be for uh, Vincent. Um, after the turmoil uh, that we've seen during the first half of 2020, uh, what's been the picture over the summer months in July and August? Have you seen any noticeable difference uh, since the end of H1? Yes, it did. It, what we did is we looked at July and August. Uh, so I just want to be uh, to be clear, it's still preliminary data. So i.e. we gathered that uh, very early September. So as you might expect, it takes time for all the fund managers to send the NAVs and so forth. So it's preliminary. But uh, out of this early, uh, early data, what we found out is pretty much uh, it's a continuation of what we observed in May, June. Uh, just to give one number, I mentioned 70% of small cap managers outperforming uh, their benchmark. It seems that this number is, is increasing further to 72 to 73%. Once again, it's preliminary data, but overall a continuation through the summer of what we observed uh, in May and June. And uh, in your opinion, do you think that can continue through H2? Uh, I think it will highly depend on the market conditions, and definitely Jean-Baptiste is better suited than me uh, to cover uh, this, uh, the market conditions that we can expect. Well, perhaps, uh, Jean-Baptiste, you could give us your perspective on that, because the, 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 the question asks, you know, what, since uh, H1, what has happened uh, since then? Um, what, what is your perspective on, on the way things are moving now as we go in towards the end of the year? Yeah, well, we, we think that um, typically um, growth is, uh, is now past its uh, initial phase of uh, the, the, the very strong rebound, uh, entering a, a more laborious uh, phase of the recovery. Um, that said, we, we think that uh, uh, continued uh, growth recovery will remain, will remain um, a, a positive tilt for, uh, for risk assets. So that's why we, we tend to have a, a, a slight uh, positive tilt on equities, commodities, high yield, and so on. Um, but in our view, um, and that's that's one of the, the driving uh, conclusions for, for, for the alpha environment, in our view, the, the, the fact that growth will be uh, quite laborious will uh, cap uh, mainline uh, mainstream assets. Uh, so returns will be uh, modest to disappointing, and we see many more uh, opportunities at sector in the, within the tech sector, um, within the consumer discretionary uh, segments, uh, also in, the, in emerging markets, we um, we tend to prefer uh, single countries um, positioning in contrast with uh, taking a, 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 an aggregate view. So, so the, maybe the key message is probably. Uh, do not expect a, to, um, very high uh, performance uh, in, uh, within the, the rest of the year um, due to uh, growth and all the, the, the political uh, uh, agenda that are uh, approaching fast. Um, we, in, our, in our view, we, we would favor a, a segment thematic approach. Uh, in, in this market. Thanks very much. The, the question. Uh, we've got two more questions. Um, the ne next one, I think, is uh, very much for you, Jean-Baptiste. Um, being quite technical, can you give me a bit more detail on your methodology for analyzing alpha? How, how do you do that, Jean-Baptiste? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good and important question, because that, that's one of the uh, yeah, yeah. Part of this analysis uh, relies on, on, on this. Um, it's true that analyzing conditions for, uh, for alpha uh, is, it, is indeed very complex uh, because multiple factors are uh, at place. Uh, at, at play, sorry, uh, the, the environment is changing uh, across region uh, in time. Um, so the, the, the way we, uh, we did this is to uh, put ourselves uh, in the, the, the shoes of the managers. On my side, uh, I've been uh, 
uh, working uh, in uh, in front of a uh, fund management uh, uh, position for for most of my career. So I've been I got very used to understand what. Uh, uh, what managers are trying to uh, to capture in markets, and so we put ourselves in, in our shoes. And I think one of the few of the key criteria for them to be successful is the first one is to have a, um, a potential of arbitrage, ways to uh, uh, exploit dispersion, uh, wide enough uh, relative arbitrage to, to 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 take. A second one, which is very important, is to have uh, some catalyst. Uh, typically, uh, funds tend to um, uh, buy stocks with the hope that uh, at some point um, uh, an event or good news will move the price towards the target. So catalyst are very important. Um, there are other um, criteria, but um, I, I would probably, uh, to avoid a catalog, I will probably uh, uh, mention uh, lastly the, um, the importance of um, fundamental pricing. Uh, typically, managers are selecting stock uh, for fundamental reason, and the, the price of these uh, stocks need to move according to, to these fundamentals. It's hard to monitor in markets, but that's really a key factor uh, to analyze and um, get some, some outlook on, on alpha. In all, all in all, uh, our view is that um, active managers tend to be favored when, uh, when alpha adds value and or when uh, beta becomes uh, weak or unstable. Uh, Thank you very much, Jean-Baptiste. We've had a question coming through the chat box, um, and I think this one will be for Vincent uh, first. Um, in your opinion, which passive strategies will be winners if economic recovery boosts, or if the economic recovery boosters? Why are small cap strategies, uh, why did small cap strategies outperform in the USA but did worse in Europe? Uh, it's to be to be fair. I think uh, we need to be careful when we compare the each ratio between two asset classes. Uh, overall, we have a 70% average each ratio between the small cap managers. So, i.e., they, they have been pretty good uh, each of them. So, I'm just looking at yeah, Europe small cap. It's just slightly below, so it's virtually the same number. So, uh, once again, we are looking at aggregates. Uh, so, i.e. The environment has been positive for pretty much all small cap managers for the reason I described, so which is typically dispersion. So dispersion between sectors, between countries, uh, between, uh, between factors. And I think, to be fair, across most of the region, uh, there has been this supportive environment for small cap managers. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think it's it's, it's fair enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, t t uh, probably one one aspect is that uh, clearly uh, small caps tend to be uh, much less covered uh, by the street, and so that um, the information uh, circulation is is much weaker. It requires more uh, DCF uh, details and analysis. That that's really where uh, expert managers uh, tend to add value. So it's not very surprising that uh, in general. Small cap will uh, will tend to uh, to behave better than uh, than large cap, to the um, the one exception of a massive uh, um, uh, massive crash. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. I have one more question. It's a very uh, specific um, question, I guess, for Vincent. Uh, in the comparisons you make, uh, the figures that you give are they net of fees? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. It's it's a, uh, it's an important one. Uh, overall, how we do that is we look at all the funds which belong to an to a category. We take obviously their net return, uh, their net of fees return. Uh, we select the, the most relevant share class for for these funds, and uh, when we compare the, the, their performance. We look at a benchmark, so it's, let's be honest, it's opinionated. We have to select the benchmark. The list of the benchmark is in the, uh, in the report uh, that if you're interested. Uh, but yes, exactly as you said, we calculate a net, a net benchmark, so, i.e. we deduct from its performance the average expense ratio of the category uh, for the ETF, which are, pre which are in this category. And if you want to know slightly more, we take the asset-weighted uh, net expense ratio of the ETF belonging to this category. Why do we do that? It's to, get them to, to get a very transparent benchmark that we use as reference for the, for the alpha, but to be fair. So, i.e., to get the most investable transparent benchmark as we can, so that we can fairly compare the performance of active managers. 
Thank you very much, Vincent, and thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, um, as well. It's been mm. a very uh, interesting um, uh, presentation. Thanks for the questions that came in by email and, the, and uh, through the, uh, the YouTube uh, chat box. Um, and thanks very much for joining us today. We look forward to um, uh, being in touch with you uh, again soon.